So those of you that first joined us said this will be the fourth one that we've done so far. Um, and it's a series that we've put on offer. We're normally a recruitment agency for those of you that don't, don't know me or haven't worked with us before. And we specialize in fundraising, innovation and digital roles. Um, taking an ethical and relationship led approach to recruitment. Most of my team are ex-fundraisers. So it's, um, it's easier to teach recruitment than it is to build a moral compass. And they're, they're all wonderful. Um, we've decided to host these webinars as a way of supporting the sector while the job market is quiet so hopefully today you'll find some stuff really useful um, and then I'll send around the link about our upcoming webinars as well that you've got because we have another one with, uh, with Catherine um, but today we will be discussing and providing tips on how you can best work with your trustees during this crisis um, I'm joined by the wonderful Catherine Miles from Catherine Miles Consulting um, those of you not familiar with her work Catherine was previously director of fundraising at Battersea Breast Cancer Now and Anthony Nolan. She was the one that uh, conceived of the idea of the high value community fundraising approach that Anthony Nolan initially had and then has been replicated across the sector. Um, and she's also a trustee at Women for Women International. And then the gentleman with us, I say gentleman sparingly, is uh, Matt Wines, Director of Fundraising at WizKids. He, um, he's worked with us for, for a very long time and during this process Matt has been negotiating with his trustee board, managing to keep income reasonably stable, his team intact and motivated um, and the board focused on long-term fundraising investments such as Legacy. Um, and he's also a trustee at Contact plus a fundraising and marketing advisory committee member for missing people. So we've got two really great people who have led fundraising departments through various amounts of change and growth um, and who have also worked on the trustee side. So we'll have some really interesting perspectives um, to be able to share with us today. Um, what we'll do first is we'll, we'll kind of discuss a couple of questions and then we'll move on to onto the screen. So I guess the first, um, topic Matt and Catherine that I thought it would be great to get your input on is what do people's trustees need to know about the impact that coronavirus is having on fundraising other than the obvious that it's a risky old time? Great shall I um shall I kick off? Yes, Morning yes. everybody thank you thank you so much for joining us hope you're doing okay in I've got no idea what week of, the, of lockdown we're in now so whatever week we're in time is a meaningless construct uh, but hopefully today's session will be useful. Um, as Ashby said, I'm Catherine Mars. My consultancy now helps charities grow their income, develop their teams and respond to coronavirus, which is the main thing at the moment. Um, and my experience with boards has included getting major programs of investment in fundraising, taking GDPR programs through and getting sign off for them, and also doing the all the relationship building with boards, um, working with them actually on major donor appeals as well, um, and, and also all the monitoring and governance and, and reporting so hopefully be able to share some useful insights, uh, particularly as a trustee now myself. So um, actually, Ashby, should we get the first slide up? That might yeah. be useful I to talk through. Yeah, let so, me try. Uh, what are helpful um, things for your trustees to know at the moment? So obviously at the moment, coronavirus is not impacting in a uniform way on fundraising teams. So if your charity has a large amount of its money coming from fundraising channels that are reliant on social interaction, so community, corporate, events, retail, you'll unfortunately be seeing more challenges, larger dips in income. Um, so it's important to get that point across to, to your trustees. Secondly, so there's some really great donor research out there of interviews with donors about what they think about coronavirus, are they going to keep giving um, and to which causes. So it's done by Blue Frog um, and at the end when we share the slides to you today after today's session they'll link to it. There's a webinar that I'd really advise you have a listen to because it's great research into what our donors are thinking and feeling about right now. But what's very clear with that is they want to keep giving they want to keep giving to their current causes they also want to give to coronavirus causes but crucially they don't think they're being asked enough so that point right now about that first point on your left hand side of that graph that diagram there that we need to keep fundraising and we need to keep asking is really important for our charities anyway but it's also what the donors are telling us they want to support they're not seeing enough fundraising asks so ironically it's a good time to be fundraising I think it's also important to share 
the lessons from past recessions with your trustees. So again, there's some useful slides which I can share afterwards on what happened after 2008 and the crash then. So there, individual giving did hold up. So there wasn't a massive, massive increase in regular giving attrition because of course many of our donors are not in the socioeconomic groups that are most affected by recessions. Now, of course, it's a massive unknown at this point. This recession that's coming may be different, but at the moment, the charities that I'm talking to are not seeing significant drops in their individual giving, regular giving base, which is fantastic. They're not seeing a sharp peak in attrition. Those donors are staying with us. So I think it's also important to remember right now, many of our donors like ourselves actually have some more disposable income. They're not paying childcare fees. They're not going out. None of us are going on holiday. None of us are traveling to work at the moment. So there is a bit more disposable income around that potentially is there for charitable donations. So it's important to keep fundraising. It's important to remember your donors still want to give, but it's also important to explain to your donors how your charity is responding to coronavirus. So the research is showing the donors are really interested in how are you maybe adapting your services or your projects. They're interested in your frontline workers and showcasing them. Interestingly, the research is also showing they're not so responsive to messages of our charity is really losing income and we may be struggling. They want to know about the work and the beneficiaries and how you're adapting and how they can help those people. Um, I think the other point to really share with your boards is fundraising is obviously going to have to adapt to social distancing. So whatever happens, social distancing is going to be with us for many months, if not years. So you're going to need time to work out how you do that in your programs. The sector is going to need to ramp up on digital. It's going to need to ramp up on innovation. And we can see lots of new fundraising activity actually this week, particularly coming to market and starting out. Mm -hmm. And you're going to need time to adjust your programs. Um, are you one find the, it, oh, sorry, Catherine. Are you finding that, Matt, that is that the messaging that you're giving to your trustees as well around that area? Yeah, I think, um, I guess <clears throat> my, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, my immediate challenge, I guess, as, as, as with a lot of people, was, was looking at what, what my forecast was and re-forecasting that really, really quickly, which involved a lot of conversations with, with all sorts of uh, all, all our funders. Um, so it was, I guess, you know, the, the immediate was reappraising the income forecast, giving some assurance around what that looked like, the assumptions I'd made, as as well as actually, um, you know, really coming up with a, a 2021 forecast too, which is much earlier than, than we would have done. Um, so we probably did that best part of two months ago now, to really give assurances about our, our future sustainability. Um, that's really continuing on an ongoing basis. So as I'm sure a lot of other people are experiencing, the, the, the board are wanting to be updated much more frequently, particularly around uh, the income. And it's really important that <clears throat> I appraise what the risks are within that. So I'm not only presenting a really current picture of what our income looks like at any one stage, but also highlighting uh, some very real risks within that to 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 that number. So, um, I guess you know my my background is I spent twenty years in banking before, so I'm all over the numbers, and that's probably the way that I've always approached it. Um, anyway, but I think the best tip I was ever given in terms of forecasting is that there aren't any surprises. Um, but you know we're under much closer scrutiny than we've been before. Um, so it's it's doubly important to be on top of the narrative. I think often in, in the past we only ever <clears throat> or, or priority is given to the income, but it's been a really useful time to emphasize the net picture because you know organizationally we're we're making um, a lot of savings, you know, events places that we're not buying. A lot of traveling that the team aren't doing they're not having to stay in accommodation to, to attend events and that sort of stuff so actually we're saving a lot of money too so um, I think it's really important to to present a net picture at this time because you can negate <coughs> some of the some of the income that that we're losing yeah. um, sorry I didn't I, you, you mentioned that um, 
in terms of this discussion, I, I've been at WizKids for, for five years where I joined as head of fundraising. So in terms of that whole board piece, I've gone from being someone that has had very little exposure to the board um, to someone that's had to really uh, build their profile internally and build their profile with the board too, to, you know, particularly at the moment that they're, that I'm someone that they trust and depend on what I tell them. So I think that, that, clear communication and, and presenting a, a, a very honest picture is is doubly important yeah no and there's a couple of people that have commented um already in terms of saying they've been echoing or saying similar things that you've you've advised um anyone else that's that's had different messaging that you've been given to to your trustees as well that would be really useful and sorry catherine so you you start finished on um kind of adapting to social distancing but i know talking about furloughing has been quite an important thing for you and i know you've had some experience with this as well matt so catherine yeah, John, yeah. Yeah, so um, I've been doing a series of off-the-record Zoom calls with um, fundraising directors, with heads of teams, with, with fundraising managers, looking at what impacts have been on their charities, um, how do we adapt, what are our insights, what are our ideas about how, how do we handle this situation. By the way, I'll be continuing to run those, they're free, so do do drop me an email, um, the details will be there afterwards if you'd like to take part, part in one of those. And when what's been really clear is the charities that have had to or have chosen to furlough large numbers of their fundraising teams have it made it found it difficult then to actually take advantage of the opportunities that are out there so we are seeing things like virtual fundraising do your own thing fundraising taking off and a lot of those teams have found they haven't had enough fundraisers available to take advantage of those opportunities so i know furloughing is is, is very challenging for a lot of charities they, a lot of charities have had no financial option but to do it but i think that age-old truism of to raise money you need your fundraising staff and i think those critical decisions about which fundraisers are brought back and how is really important and i think there it's very much worth charities thinking about the opportunity cost Yes, they may be getting the furlough costs of those fundraiser staff salary, but how much more money could those fundraisers be raising for them if they were back and working? I think then at the point, further point around cutting fundraising investment helps your in-year position, but it always reduces your future year's income. You need to spend money to raise money. And it's so important and it's challenging for boards right now, looking at the numbers they are to try and hold on and protect that fundraising investment as much as possible. But we know the fundraising teams that are going to come through the best on this are the ones that manage to hold on to their investment. Yes. So that is an absolute crucial point. And I think there's also then finally something around charities, really fundraisers need charities to be able to take faster, more flexible decisions. And there's many wonderful things about our sector, but I think we would probably all recognise that speed of decision making sometimes isn't perhaps our forte. Mm. And I'm sure those of you on the webinar have, have probably experienced this over the last few weeks and months. And I think it's not about panicking. It's not about knee jerking. It's not about running around like headless chickens, changing everything in your fundraising programme. But I'm sure there's times where, quite frankly, you need fewer levels of sign off right now. You need to be able to move faster. You need flexibility about how you're moving fundraising investment between channels, between teams. You potentially are going to need to reconfigure your fundraising programs, potentially look at skills audits across your teams, maybe reconfigure your teams. So you're going to need more speed and flexibility. And that's something that if trustees can get behind that, actually they can really help they can really help speed up those decision making processes yeah and Matt I know when we talked you're you've taken the decision to not furlough low I mean some charities have been furloughing 60% of their staff WizKids have, haven't done that have, so how did you kind of get that messaging across to your trustees the importance of having those fundraisers in the in the office uh, it's exactly what Catherine said you know the, the and so we only fur furloughed 20% <clears throat> of the team <coughs> sorry and um I need more water. they were um <laughs> i'm gonna ask you questions as soon as you cough <laughs> that's gonna be my new tone <laughs> yeah it's an asthma cough by the way oh, but, sorry. Um, nothing more sinister uh, but um oh, yeah, yeah we, we um we only we took so I, I sold that decision to to the trustees by talking about the opportunities that that there would be and actually the need for us to really push forward and make sure that um, we were not just taking advantage of the opportunities that there are now but 
um, planning for the future and making sure that, you know, I, I've talked a lot to the team about making sure that we are in the best possible position to, to exit this. And, you know, so we will be running an appeal, but only when we have sight of, you know, moving out of this a little bit. So as things are relaxed uh, a bit more, <coughs> um, and, and yeah, that, that was talked to, the, I talked to the trustees about the future opportunity, but actually the, the danger around us not being prepared and not being ready and, uh, and just simply highlighted the fact that, you know, if we went too crazy, then in terms of furloughing staff, then actually our recovery was going to take much, much longer. Um, and uh, I, I'm, you know, whilst I only furloughed 20% of staff, I'm, I'm already bringing some of those back to start working on uh, future stuff around um, digital, but also making sure that we're well set up to uh, respond to any emergency funding opportunities that come up because there's plenty of those too. And some of those are, are, are significant opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's it's definitely it's that kind of knee jerk reaction that I know that many of us have kind of talked about before of kind of getting rid of of those many staff or putting them onto furlough and then see it, you know seeing what happens. But if you've got no one there to to have those conversations with, it makes it really difficult for for funding to be secured. So what we'll um, do now is just switch out of the slides and just go into a, a couple of questions that I'd asked um, asked you both to consider before this as well, and then we'll come back into um, a couple of useful diagrams that um, Catherine has found really useful for presenting to boards in the past which I know um, good to see Katie Hepworth has already commented saying that last last time we were together they um, they were really useful there so I'll just stop that so you should see us back on your on your screens now if technology is all working well um, so in terms of I guess building long-term relationships with with trustees so Matt you touched a little bit on working your way up from from head of to direct to where you are now and how how that you have to buy, buy, build credibility with them so talk just talk us through your your steps and how you did that initially and what tips you'd give to people uh, I think it's anything like this it, it's you know you, you have to build your 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 credibility with them and to the extent that you know they they trust and depend upon um what you're telling them and, and will react to to your recommendations the way that i've done that and and to gain their trust so i guess i i came into the role when there'd been a period of instability at whiz kids and maybe there hadn't been uh the the trust in previous directors so I, I decided that I was just going to keep my messaging really clear and simple I think you know I've sat on uh, boards myself and I think it, it can be really difficult when the, the the information that you receive isn't clear or accurate or actually it's just clogged with a huge amount of detail and your your key points get lost Catherine's um, nodding I, with that way. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the amount of detail you see in board papers is is ridiculous, and just working out what the key message is is mm. really difficult. And you know, it means that I often leave or have in the past left the board meeting with loads of questions, not just about what's happening, but you then start to question, you know, dare I say it, the capability of the of the senior team, and I think. I, so, so my objective has always been to deliver a really strong, accurate message that leaves the recipient um, with no questions or questions that they can ask at the time. But I think, you know, in terms of all of us doing our, our day jobs, so I'm talking, I guess, from the point of view of being a trustee, but in terms of doing our day jobs too, there's, there's nothing more frustrating than uh, maybe a you know a slightly awkward board meeting which is then followed up with loads of email discussion and questions because one you know you might feel a bit undermined but two it just leaves you not knowing what's coming next and that's an incredibly stressful situation to be in so i've i've always tried to be really clear and deliver really simple 
messaging even when that's unpleasant messaging you know they need to hear it these guys are, are ultimately responsible for for the running of our organization so it's important when there's difficult messaging um, to convey that really clearly so that they're under no illusion as to um, what's going on and what the risks are mm, right and uh, Catherine in terms of your steps to building a long-term relationship with the trustees what do what do you would you add to that yeah, I mean, very similar with Matt, but as Matt being open and transparent, I actually, before I went into each board meeting, I used to remind myself in the lift going up of four C's. Now, there's no swear words coming here, people. You Don't, don't be alarmed, Ashby, this is fine. <laughs> um, so I used to think I needed to be calm, I needed to be constructive, I needed to be concise, and I needed to be credible. And it was just a useful touch point I found um, to exactly Matt's point of trying to explain as clearly as I could what was happening and what we were trying to achieve. Being conscious that trustees are enormously busy people. They don't have time to read huge board papers. They're not experts. If you give them a ton of operational detail, they will ask operational questions and they'll start parachuting in on you know famously christmas cards um so it's really about trying to keep the conversation strategic trying to be open trying to explain things in ways that that make sense to them um and absolutely being realistic not op optimistic being open being open about you know the central truism of don't spring a nasty surprise on them you know it's much much better to be upfront about something that may have gone wrong be about to go wrong or be a problem because i think the other important point to remember is trustees know not not everything is perfect in a charity they know there's always going to be challenges they know there's going to be challenges around service delivery and raising money and of course right now trustees totally understand this is a really difficult time and they're not expecting miracles. So I think trying to be open and honest and transparent is, is really important. Mm, right. One of the best bits of advice I was give, ever given was exactly what, what Catherine just said. You know, the art of good forecasting is that mm -hmm. there are no nasty surprises. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, that can't always be the case. You know, you might get some huge fund, especially now, you know, mm -hmm. that you might get some huge funder pull their funding or, or delay their funding or whatever. Um, but it's really important that you're honest and, and deliver that message as soon as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, so we, we launched that poll at the beginning of the, of the webinar around just to get out an understanding of how are people feeling. So the first question was, do you feel your trustee board has a realistic understanding of the fundraising market currently? Um, and Jennifer's put a question which we'll, we'll come to at the end, which kind of taps into this. But only 22% of people that answered said they felt like their trustee board did have a realistic understanding of the market um the remainder so 39 percent said no they didn't have an idea and or a clear idea and then 39 percent they had a somewhat clear idea um what other than the, the steps we've, we've already discovered what else can people do to get a sense of realism into their trustee boards and the challenges that fundraising is facing at the moment i think it's quite handy to try and cite some um some context in the sector so i think without again overwhelming them with loads of information it's worth pulling up examples of where people are talking about so for example um very early on cancer research came out very publicly to say they felt they had at least 25 percent of their income at risk this year and it wasn't going to come through and they'd already made decisions to hold certain grant funding rounds on research so i think being able to cite sort of context of something like that of look even the biggest name in the sector is looking at a really significant income loss here this this is potentially how challenging it is is helpful um, if there's key simple facts that people can can get their, their their heads around and i guess the other side of things is the continual process to build your trustees understanding of how fundraising works and actually ashby i don't know if this is a good time to go to those yes. pipe maybe can you skip yeah. down and come back to the kpi um example so these coming up on your screens now hopefully are a couple of <laughs> my lovely assistant is doing marvelous anthea, Turner, anthea redfern a bigger fun fund to my a bruce forsyth for those of you who are in a certain age bracket and uh, potentially for 90 percent of the webinar that cultural reference will make no sense at all um so 
what I've done over with successive boards is try to explain how fundraising in the UK works. So this is a really simple slide I've used about the main sources of UK voluntary income. So this is how Britain gives basically and it's a helpful then comparator to then what are the income sources for your particular charity what's also interesting about this slide is it always makes trustees look at that and go i can't believe there's so relatively little money coming from companies coming from the corporate fundraising sector and that's always an interesting conversation um so actually if we can skip on to the next one ashby thank you marvelous so this is a really simple slide so one pie chart where is your net income coming from at the moment? And here you can talk about your fundraising mix. You can explain how each of those different income streams work, how they require different levels of cash investment or time investment, how the different return on investments work, the importance of having a balanced portfolio and not having all your fundraising eggs in one basket. And dear God, we've seen the importance of that over the last few weeks. And then I would always show them a future pie chart of the split of net income. Now, I would use that to try and explain how we were trying to potentially change the fundraising mix and therefore why they were seeing the fundraising strategy that they were. And I would always relate that to the fundraising strategy always has to sync to your organisational strategy. So how much money does your organisation need or what type and when and therefore over time potentially you may be in a situation of needing to change your fundraising mix of course right now you could use that for where you think your fundraising mix is going to be next year or due to the impact of coronavirus so you could use that to kind of say this is where we were before coronavirus hit this is where we think our money is going to come from in 2021 as coronavirus works its way through and again, it's a really simple visual representation, but I found it has sparked helpful conversations and, and it helped them start to understand. Yeah, it is that being clear, isn't it? And, and understand, rather than giving them loads and loads of pages that say all of this, some simple diagrams that gets that across easily. Any, anything else you'd add, Matt, to really make, making sure trustees understand the, the threats to the fundraising market currently? No, I think it, it's it's really important to use a lot of the ex external intelligence and examples that are out there. As Catherine said, there's there's loads of it out there, and it is it, it's really incumbent upon us to to be the ones that educate them a little bit because you know one it, it makes our lives much easier. But that that's part of our role, as as I see it, is to uh, and it and it may well be that you know to do that you need to find an advocate in the board to help you deliver that messaging. Um, that can be really useful and that's often, you know, can be the role that I've helped play uh, as a trustee myself, because uh, often uh, board members will listen to another trustee or maybe give that more credence than, than the member of the senior team, which isn't necessarily right, but it does, completely reinforce what you're saying so if you don't have that i try and go about finding that ally that can help you deliver that message yeah i've absolutely had that on all three boards that i've worked to as, as director where there were individual trustees who were really just really interested in fundraising which was brilliant and yes so we would do separate briefings for them um, we would actually almost sort of do fundraising teach-ins for them um, and they would really they would delve in a lot more detail um, and it was invaluable when it came to the big investment discussions when it came to the big budget discussions because they genuinely had um, the deeper understanding and they, they could talk equally with credibility it's also a really nice way of reinforcing governance um, and appropriate scrutiny. So um, particularly at and I work very closely with the chair of the finance committee. So the fact that he could say to the trustees, as well as the finance committee looking at these investment proposals, I've also met with Catherine separately. We've gone through it in detail. I'm happy, I'm supportive of the proposal. It's, that's very reassuring for a board to know that there's been that level of, of dialogue. Um, so yes, if you can find that ally, and sometimes there can be two or three people, Matt, can't they, which is brilliant, yeah. then that, they can be unbelievably powerful. Yeah. Mm. 
interesting that both of both of you kind of touched on that in terms and coming on to the other question that we asked at the beginning which has your trustee board restricted investment in fundraising um so in terms of response from that we had 17 percent of people say yes uh 39 say no there's been no restriction on fundraising and then 43 percent said to, to some degree there has been um, so if you are a leader at the moment and you're trying to negotiate uh, your trustee board into, into investing in fundraising, whether that's digital or whatever area, what's the best steps for, for you to take to try and get that money out of them, them now? I, can only <laughs> talk, <laughs> I guess I can only talk from person, personal experience as to what I've done recently. And um, I think it, it's really important, again, to use that outside intelligence and examples of what's going on in the sector right now, because they won't know about things like, you're highly unlikely to know about things like, you know, the 2.6 challenge and um, the opportunity that there is within, within digital. And, and again, that's part of our role to let them know. So I think, you know, I... Uh, at the it was at the end of last year so you know prior to all of this I, I built a really strong business case that used lots of that outside intelligence and I also um, got a colleague uh, I, I built a case study from what another organization had done with with legacy fundraising to just use as, a, as an appendix to my business case I wanted to, to, to uh, I wanted to secure investment in, uh, to build a legacy program but also to uh, develop our digital capacity as well um, and so I used all sorts of examples I built this this case study that I could present to them um, and I secured the investment that that I wanted which you know for us as an organization was um, the most investment there'd been in fundraising for probably seven or eight years. Um, and uh, this situation has, has evolved since and, and that investment is is untouched. Um, and the reason for that, so, you know, we, we are making expenditure savings, but the board bought into that business case so much that uh, and I very much positioned that as, as a need for us to diversify our income streams, mm -hmm. that actually everything that happens or is happening now has totally reinforced the need for us to move in the direction that, that I've suggested. So the investment is, in, is untouched. So I think it's all about how you position it and uh, the strength with which you deliver it now you know every organization is different and will be under different pressures so that's not necessarily going to work for everyone but that's how i that's how i went about it okay. yeah and i think also i think always always relating back what you're trying to achieve um through your fundraising investment to what the organization needs to achieve so linking back to you know as trustees this is the organizational strategy you've signed off on and you want the charity to be able to do this is the money you need therefore this is the investment we need to be able to make that happen um and i think as well talking about lead in time so i think the fact that you know the decisions your trustees are making right now are going to completely determine the income that your charity gets in 2021 2022 etc and i think trying to explain to them the fact that okay you know you invest in individual giving now in 2020 that will be breaking even probably in 2023 and then those donors will be continuing to give to you you know right the way into sort of 2030 2040s and trying to explain the ramifications actually if you don't make fundraising investments now mm. in a lot of area fundraising areas it's too late to try and bring that investment back in in 2021 because of the lead in times um so some of the stuff i've also done for boards is take each of the main income streams and just set out to them you know what the typical lead in time is to try and secure a corporate partner and that money actually coming on stream um the fact that you might buy big race packages you know frequently at times 18 months if not two years ahead of the actual race mm -hmm. so trying to explain to them because there's no if you're just a trustee that's joined the board there's no reason why you would know that why you would know fundraising is such a long-term thing so i think trying to give them practical examples of the lead in times is helpful yeah it's hard looking i suppose once you're once you're in fundraising you're in that circle it's hard to then explain to someone that maybe doesn't have that the real basic 
and the intricacies of, of an area. You just have to assume people know nothing, which is hard, especially when these are senior individuals often in business, it's hard then to, to baby them and explain things really simply unless they give you that, that opening. Um, and then just in terms of, so one of the questions that someone uh, submitted pre, pre this taking place is, is the kind of age old, how do you get your trustee board to become major donors or at the very least open their networks? What successes, uh, there will always be challenges, but what successes or what have you found works? <laughs> to, 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 to do this? Oh my God, as, as a major gifts fundraiser, I'm now probably going to say something semi-controversial and, and get thrown out of the major gifts fundraising club. <laughs> I think you have to be incredibly careful with this. Um, because essentially if your trustees haven't been recruited on that basis then it, there's a risk of alienating them if you suddenly pop up and say to someone we want you to make a major gift and a major gift for this charity is five or ten thousand pounds I think it's really also really important to think about people's main roles as trustees are around leading the organization having that governance role enabling the organization to be well run and achieve its purpose now that may happily coincide with someone who's incredibly wealthy and might be able to make a major gift but if you're only focusing on those people you're going to be recruiting from a very narrow pool of trustees you're certainly going to have a big issue with diversity given the ways of the world and who holds money uh in the uk um and also as well you're potentially going to be fishing from a very narrow pool of skills and experience and expertise and potentially then sort of slightly undermining that key, the importance of that key trustee role and function. I think as well, you can end up in a situation that if you have major donors on your boards, sometimes that can lead to conflicts of interest for them. So it can be tricky, for example, if their big gift is going to a, to a particular project, and maybe the board is looking at that area at work and actually having serious discussions about whether the charity should continue it, is it effective, is it delivering? And then that can get very awkward around the table if you've got the donor that that project is conditional on. And it's just, it can be very, very difficult for everyone, frankly. Um, so I think having worked on in major gifts fundraising for a number of years, run appeals, I think models like recruiting donors and networkers onto development boards, into giving clubs, acting as individual networkers can be a much, much more effective way than trying to turn your main board of trustees all into major donors um, because the consequences of it are quite tricky and again it's the major gifts theory from the states um, and the states are ahead of us in major gifts theory and do one, many wonderful things i think this is one of the things that doesn't quite translate brilliantly to the uk context oh, i thought you were going to say something very different i thought you were just going to say demand they will give you money and kick them off if they don't <laughs> <laughs> you never cease to surprise me <laughs> matt I, I'd agree completely. I think, you know, the first thing that, that you need to consider is who, who, who are your board? Um, because not everyone has the capacity to do that. But, you know, an organisation I worked for, um, the board had all been board members for 10 years plus, and it was like an old boys network, and they'd never been asked to do anything. You know, they're all just kind of patting each other on the back, telling each other what a great job they were doing. Um, so, you know, you're never going to make that work is, is, is the short answer. So it, it depends from, from organisation to organisation. And, you know, another organisation I've been at had exactly that problem where, you know, the, the board were major donors that were specifically funding projects that were underperforming, which made that an incredibly difficult conversation. And uh, to have objectively as to what happens to that programme and what's the what's the right thing to do so it, it's yeah we, we have to treat it with <clears throat> an extreme amount of caution but you know i have a trustee now who's an incredible uh fundraiser and does some some great stuff so i think you know when that opportunity <coughs> sorry trust yeah when the opportunity does arise for a trustee to to fundraise that you you simply need to uh find out what it is they're interested in what what motivates them and then provide absolutely incredible stewardship to them and the people that that they introduce but the first realization needs to be that this isn't for everybody <clears throat> and it's definitely not for every organization you yeah. need to tread very very carefully around it yeah <laughs> i guess added to that is one thing i have done is 
and a charity where we were doing a particular project and initiative where it was quite important for us to be able to say to other donors, potential new donors, that all of our main board was giving. We had a very honest conversation with them about um, this can absolutely be at a level which is financially appropriate to you. So it gives them the option of if you if you don't have a huge amount of, of personal financial resources, you can do something, you know, a relatively small scale, a direct debit of £10 a month, for example. But it enabled us as a fundraising team, you know, to be able to answer the question of, well, are your boards backing this? Are your, are your boards giving? And us be able to say, yes, they were. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's some nuances if there's a particular message you need to deliver to other donors, which is not making your main board feel incredibly uncomfortable and as if they're being pressurised for money that they definitely don't have. Um, and it also doesn't lead you down that route of, yes, just recruiting wealthy people onto your main boards of trustees. Yeah. Okay. And just in terms of go going into some questions, so, um, we'll come back onto Jennifer's one because I think that's a really interesting one but in terms of the Georgia just mentioned there following up from your points should you just let trustees come to you in that case in terms of is there anything proactive that you can do without pressuring oh, no, it's you, loads can, you can proactively have mm. conversations with them around what you know is it's and and provide them with uh the I'd, I'd be proactive about having the conversation but I'd also be prepared to to back off if it's not right um i don't i think if you wait for them to come to you it's probably never going to happen so <laughs> i think you, you you know you have to you have to work out how to broach that and how to have that conversation but it's a it's a valid conversation to have uh but know that it might not go anywhere yeah. absolutely and generally what i've done with every main board of trustees is look at who those who they are um try and get some idea behind of where, where i think their networks might be and then as matt said go and have individual one-to-one -one conversations about um how do they see their involvement as a trustee talk about um typically how trustees can help us network because of course some of the power of your board can be they may not have their own massive personal wealthy contacts but they might be brilliant advocates for you who actually are brilliant to take along to donor meetings because they can talk passionately about the organization they're likely to be senior hopefully and, and credible in their own field so there's lots of ways that they can help a major donor program even if they themselves are not an enormous big giver or don't have actually direct networks um, what i've usually found through that process is there's usually at least one or two things every board member can do. And some, sometimes it's as simple as, oh yes, actually I do know X person at this charitable trust you're targeting. Yes, I can try and get us a meeting. And it's as simple as that. It's just that introduction. Other times, as Matt said, you know, you will have some people on your board who do, who are actually wealthy or have access to, to monies. And then it's that individual conversation about how they might be able to give. So I think it's very much, look at it on a case by case basis. Other things I've done sometimes is do, again, like little teachings and training sessions for boards about how major donors work how the networking angle works how solicitations work which is helpful for their knowledge of fundraising and also helps then set you up for can i come and have a coffee with each of you just to have a chat about what may or may not be possible here yeah and it is that learning isn't it jennifer again has commented that she's surprised that her trustees didn't understand the importance of unrestricted funding rather than restricted so it is that don't assume that people know everything you know talk talk them through that step by step um, and in regards as Tara's asked around in regards to trustees that are really well-meaning and come and say I've got loads of high net worth individuals in my networks there's loads of them how do you what where what's your start set, starting steps with, with getting them to open those up and that is literally never happened no uh, <laughs> yeah, I think again I think it's that okay let's share that let's share that information let's get our prospect researcher or prospect research teams to to have a look at those um and then do some degree of clarification on it some degree of prioritization um and then gently start to make some approaches i think sometimes the challenge can be you can sometimes have trustees who feel that their relationships to those people are stronger than they are in reality um and that sometimes can lead to a bit of awkwardness if you start to do the right let's reach out let's see if we can get meetings and you get a whole series of no's um but but i think it is that sense of gathering the information looking at what's there looking at where you think a good fit would be and also really trying to prioritize their time because i've also um you can have sometimes have trustees who actually have lots of contacts 
want to try and almost like do a mail shot to them and actually what you really need to do is prioritize that trustees time into these are the ones these are the three that we think are the best let's focus on these first and see what how, what we can develop with them i think it's ask, it's asking them how you know these are their relationships so actually how what do they think the right approach is and, and uh how we go about engaging them because you know they they are their friends or business contacts or whatever so you know what what's their take on it is that they need to we need to actually get them doing something rather than just handing over a name and a number get them to realize that actually they're the individual that needs to take this relationship forward yeah probably uh, possibly but um not not necessarily just rely on us so what do they think that looks like and just get them to understand that element of it if they don't already Mm, and I suppose being empathetic to you know putting yourself in their shoes if this was your network and you were asked to go to five of your friends and ask them for gifts it's a bit daunting and kind of talking them through that that process just assuming again that they don't know everything and, and making sure you're giving them enough access to information which also in terms of um Jennifer's question around so she obviously digital fundraising is the area that's growing and and people are looking to invest in her trustees don't understand digital so how does she upskill them in digital? Yeah, in, co in common with most of the sector, I think we would probably <laughs> say. Um, so, so I think there's, again, there's some useful examples of pick some digital fundraising projects or initiatives that you've seen in the sector that you think are really nice and show them it. Um, Council Research Care are doing some really interesting stuff at the moment with Dryathlon um, in that they're out saying do Dryathlon for a week and just make a £10 donation and then if you want to do it for a month you can start to fundraise. So even just screenshotting um, that main Cancer Research UK Dryathlon page um, about how they're positioning that activity is, is actually really interesting for, for trustees to see. Um, I think there's always, it's an important two probably main things for trustees to get their hand, hands around um digital encompasses a lot of different ways that fundraising can work um it can be a channel it can be an activity um and it's important to kind of get to realize it's almost sort of like not a thing entirely of its itself it's a, it's an enabler it's an ability to reach out and engage with your sports in lots of different ways so it is slightly different than other income streams i always find it slightly weird when you see charity budgets for it's like fundraising trust fundraising digital fundraising um so i think trying to get that across and then secondly really trying to get expert advice into your organization if you don't already have it in-house because it is very specialist physical events don't automatically translate into being virtual digital events and you need that expertise because it works in a very specific way um i think the other thing to remember is about sort of 15 20 years ago fundraisers thought actually this was absolutely going to revolutionize everything in fundraising we were going to move away from all traditional methods we were just going to have to build a website and the money would just roll in of course it doesn't work like that and the amount of money that is actually given online is still relatively small it's less than 10 percent of charity donations so it's also really important to try and explain a little bit of that context of where digital can leverage money and actually where it can't and to try and avoid those conversations of why don't we just do something on social media that will go viral? Um, or people less keen on things going viral at the moment. Um, and um, and um, surely we just put a donate button on our Facebook page and we make millions. Yeah, I, I think, think it's I think it's really clear. Oh, it, it, it's really important to be absolutely clear about what you mean by digital, because digital means something different to everybody. So, do you mean individual giving acquisition? Mm -hmm. Do you mean you know uh, a a virtual event do you mean uh, a whole new gaming strategy so i think it, it's uh, as catherine says digital it, it, there's so many facets to it i think you need to identify rather than just going with an all-encompassing uh, digital strategy you have to be really really specific about what that is and why you were doing it for your organization and why that's going to work um because yeah i mean you know what does what does digital even mean? Um, I think you, you just need to be really, really clear about exactly what that is before you start talking to trustees about it, because yeah. it will mean something different to every one of them. Nice. And they may well be a group of people that don't have a particularly clear understanding of it anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah.
I think anyone that vaguely uses the term digital is normally someone that doesn't understand what digital <laughs> means, which is why I just said digital. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's true. It's so different from from every different organisation. Uh, Jennifer, it might be useful to say that the next event that a webinar that we've got is on gaming, and then the one after is on adapting your traditional channels. So uh, challenge events, uh, community, and IG and face face acquisition to to embrace digital. So um, join us for a couple of those as well. Um, perfect. OK. And in terms of cause just looking at time, we're kind of wrapping up. Any last points you'd like to leave any of the audience with? Yeah. Could we just pop up that KPI slide? Because that might be yeah, a useful thing. Again, I've, I've seen people on the chat stream have been um, shamelessly stealing my um, slides and graphs and, and using them. And I thoroughly encourage that to nick away people. This is excellent. So this actually is something I can't entirely claim credit for. So um, a wonderful colleague at Breast Cancer Now um, originally developed this as a KPI dashboard for the Board of Trustees. So what it was an attempt to do is to try and pick out what are the really, really key numbers and trends and performance indicators in your fundraising program and how can you present them on the same graphs each time so trustees have that consistency and transparency of the information and ideally keep them maybe to eight to ten key performance indicators across the program so ideally this goes on a two-page board paper and it would go to them quarterly and it actually helped to replace those very detailed operational reports. So it was our way of coming around those issues of we're all writing reams of detail. It's overwhelming the trustees. It's not actually enabling us to have the conversations we need to have. So these are just some of the examples that I've pulled out of ways that you might want to be monitoring and evaluating how your fundraising program is doing. And of course, there'll be there'll be different indicators for each fundraising mix and each stage of development you're at. But what I found helpful was if I was just putting out some simple charts like this, sharing them quarterly, it enabled us to talk through what were the really, really key numbers and aspects of the program. And it enabled them to track over time, right? Are, are we on track really? Are we, are we achieving what we said we would do in our fundraising strategy and in our investment and budget discussions? So it was just a really simple and helpful way of doing it. And as I said, I think trying to, trying to keep it to maybe eight to 10 max, and make the graphs as simple and clear as possible is helpful and resist the temptation to then give a load of written narrative with it just present it like this and have the discussion yeah no it makes it so it just draws the eye doesn't it so much more and makes it especially because you've you both have been on the other side of having those reports with you I, again understanding that other person's position and their time pressures is really really helpful um perfect okay well let's leave it there then there was another question that just came through to me but i um i'll follow up with the kind of a blog piece because i think there's um we've already covered that in a little bit of detail but thank you so much to our panel so catherine as she said she is offering one-to-one -one sessions um, and also hosting roundtables with fundraising leaders throughout this so um i will send around her contact details in a wrap-up email so that you can get in touch with her directly um, they have been really interesting i think you attended one of the round table sessions as well didn't you matt yeah yeah it was really good Perfect. Uh, and and if if nothing else um it was it was kind of just really reassuring to <laughs> sit around with a with a group of other fundraising directors and talk through everything that's going on right now and and um so yeah no i definitely recommend it Perfect. You're, you're le leading the sector with hope, Catherine. That's the, <laughs> that's a good thing. Adding reassurance. <laughs> um, well, at least doing a little bit of um, uh, letting people to blow off steam as well. And yes, the one-to-one -one sessions on this particularly, I, I guess we're all conscious of there may be situations you're facing with your trustees that you wouldn't want to post up in a, in a chat stream that everyone can see or else publicly. So very happy to kick around those if you've got situations that are a little tricky and you want to kick some ideas around. Yeah, it's always good to get that that extra perspective. Um, and yeah, so you will send through Catherine's details. I'll also send a, the links to the upcoming webinars so that you can join on to those. Um, if you enjoyed today, please do post on LinkedIn. We're trying to enhance our brand whilst recruitment's quiet. So any help that you can do on that and tag in Catherine and Matt, that would be lovely. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Perfect. Right, right. Thanks. Take care then. Bye, everyone. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye. Thank you.